Albine, you've waited a long time to fly. You've been in the program for quite a few years. You were among the third group of astronauts brought into the program. How do you feel about finally going on Apollo 12? Pretty happy, and I think it's been worth the wait. Worth the wait. <laughs> you said it. How long have you been in the program? I've been in since, uh, I think it's February of 1963. And uh, it's been... Uh, a constant train since then, and it's been the uh, most interesting experience anyone could imagine. Now, many of our listeners can tell from hearing your speech that you're from the Southwest, right? You're a Texan? Uh, yes, Fort Worth, Texas is my home, and uh, my wife's home is uh, Dallas, so this is pretty much home country to us. How did you get into flying as a young man? Young uh, man. I uh, had always wanted to be a naval aviator. And uh, when I graduated from high school, I was selected to the NRATC program at the University of Texas. I graduated from there in aeronautical engineering, went to flight training, and then uh, just gradually migrated from flight training to test pilot to uh, the business we're in now. What sort of uh, airplanes have you flown? A lot of uh... Most of my experience has been in light jet attack, like the A4D, A4Es, F9s. I uh, had the opportunity when I was at test pilot at Patuxent River to fly uh, all the Navy jets, so I've, I've uh, had some experience flying uh, most of the Navy airplanes. Well, one of the requirements for astronauts selected at the time your group came in was extensive experience in, uh, in jet aircraft, right? It was, and uh, in fact it still is. As you know, the uh, scientist astronauts or the people that we're bringing aboard now that don't have any flight training, we're sending them off to flight school. When you take a look at a lunar mission, it becomes pretty obvious that the majority of your total, let's say, 10-day mission, 240 hours, the majority of the hours is spent actually doing some sort of flying skill. We've got 30 hours on the surface on our mission. If you, if you subtract the 30 from the 244, you end up with a great percentage that's really just uh, stick and throttle work. And to do this, you're going to need a background of, of flying. Now, during your period here, in Houston with the astronaut program, you've had other assignments. You were on uh, a backup crew for one of the Gemini flights, weren't you? Yes, I backed up uh, Gemini 10, where John Young and Mike Collins made a couple of beautiful rendezvous. After that, uh, Pete Dick and I backed up Apollo 9, where Jim McDivitt, Dave Scott, and Rusty Schweikert did the first uh, Earth orbital operations of the limb. In fact, that uh, particular assignment has helped us immeasurably uh, getting ready for Apollo 12 and has allowed us to devote a lot of our training time to the actual lunar surface work that we're going to do and uh, because we've had such a background in flying the lamb and rendezvousing and many of the things that we're going to do uh, in flight on Apollo 12. Describe briefly your activities in traveling around and preparing for those flights and this one, how you come and go from Houston. Our headquarters, of course, is here, as all of us are, at the Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston. And this is our home base. This is where a lot of our training is done. But because uh, the spacecraft are built at uh, North American and California and for the command module and for at Grumman up in New York for the LEM, we spend some of our time during uh, the time when our particular spacecraft is being, is being built in those areas. Now, as we get closer to flight in the command module, the LEM go to the Cape and start to uh, be checked out there and erected on top of the Saturn V, moved to the pad, then we have to necessarily spend time down there checking out uh, the limb with, with uh, the people at Cape Kennedy. So we end up doing a lot of our work in that area. I would say uh, we average about four or five days a week, either Los Angeles, New York, or like now and for the last six months, usually down at the Cape working in the simulators there and working with the spacecraft down there. Then hopefully home to be with your family on weekends. That's right. It hasn't been that way for the last several weeks, but uh, that's typical when you get very close to flight. How many children do you have? I have two. I have a boy, Clay, that's 13, and uh, he's in the ninth grade on the swimming team, and he seems to be doing real well, pretty excited about the flight. And I have a girl, Amy, who's... Uh, six and she's in the first grade and she's probably more excited than anybody else uh, about the flight. Do you think Clay may ever want to be an astronaut? Has he indicated I don't any? know. He hasn't talked about it. I think there's a tendency for boys to uh, not necessarily follow in their father's footsteps, so we'll have to see what he decides to do. Al, you're going to be on the moon much longer than was Apollo 11. You will have two periods of extravehicular activity. 
you and Pete Conrad expect to do quite a bit of geological sampling. Let's just talk about that a bit. Uh, during your first period outside, what sort of things are you going to look for and how are you going to move around? As you well know, our, f our first period outside is going to be devoted largely to ALSEP. Uh, because the experiments the, package. Yeah, actually putting out the, the experiments package. Then with what time we've got available left, which is, let's say, half an hour, three quarters an hour, it's hard to tell right now because we're going to try to, to uh, fit in any available free time we have doing as much geology as we can. We're going to do what we call a documented sample. And what we're going to do here is look around for as many different kinds of lunar rocks and lunar geological features we can see. We're going to take pictures of them, not too detailed, but just enough so that we can remember them so that people uh, on the... Uh, uh, scientists here on Earth will be able to reconstruct what we saw and get as many different kinds of rocks as we can. We're going to load these rocks in the rock boxes and take them in with us in the first EVA. And this will, will uh, be sort of the, uh, what was formerly the bulk sample. We're just going to try to get a little more information. Mm -hmm. Now the uh, second time we get out, our main objective is to do a very good documented sample. And by documented sample, I mean we want to take a look at once again, as many different kinds of lunar rocks as we can see, and many different kinds of unusual lunar geographical features as we can, we can spot. But we want to document them very accurately. For example, if we are going to collect a rock, Pete and I have a sort of skit, or rock dance as I call it, that we go through. We move over to the rock. Pete steps cross sun to it by about four feet, and before he steps to this position, he puts down a gnomon. And this gnomon is sort of like a little sundial where we can... Uh, it casts a shadow near the rock, and you can tell the orientation of the rock relative to north or east or anywhere else. And you can also tell the tilt of it, and it also allows you to do some color matching because there's colors on this gnomon. He puts this down near the rock, and then he steps across sun. I move in then to a down sun position, take a picture. He takes a stereo pair across sun, and then starts to pick up the rocks with his tongs. I then get a sample bag. We put the rock in the bag maybe a quick discussion about any unusual features. Which we expect to hear. Yeah, we'll say a few words. Now, one of the interesting things about lunar surface operations is there is a discrete amount of time that you've got, and it's small. So the question is, what do you want to do with it? Do you want to spend it all describing one rock, or do you want to collect as many rocks as you can and say nothing about any of them? Well, there must be a balance, and what we've been trying to do over the last year of training is to get this balance, and we think we've got a pretty good one. At least it's, it's the one we're going to use. Now, scientists are right here in the Mission Control Center talking to you and uh, coordinating your activities with you so that they can try to document as much of your activity as possible at the same time, aren't they? That's right. This is going to be one of the differences between our particular exploration and the 11s, uh, and also, I think we'll see it on all the following missions. As the lunar surface operation gets more complex, you're going to have to use the man on the surface to make on-the-spot observations and collections. But he isn't always going to have a lot of spare time to sit around and pontificate about just exactly what he's been seeing. So they're going to have a lot of scientists on Earth in the con Mission Control Center that are thinking, listening to what you're saying, thinking about what you're saying, and trying to come up with any... Uh, big picture that they might think of that we might not on there because we're, we're actually doing a lot of work collecting samples and, and as I say, don't have always the time to sit back and reflect. They'll be reflecting and they'll come back and give us some advice. Go over this crater, find mm -hmm. this rock. It looks like you're in an area where there may be a, an unusual uh, uh, number of uh, uh, boulders being ejected from a crater two miles to the north. How about working a little bit more in that direction? We can't go two miles, but we might be able to go closer to it and find some additional ejecta from that crater. And so this is going to be a, a real team operation between the scientists on Earth and ourselves on the lunar surface. How much material do you expect to bring back? We've got uh, the capability to bring back two rock boxes full, which would amount to about 60 pounds of box. And that's quite a lot of samples. Each? Each. 60 pounds each.